tell there's a, a, poet, uh, the, a guy I know who's an activist in New York City, uh, primarily does, he's a, you know, a teacher in Harlem, and he, um, he does like, uh, you know, like, this um, movement for, for schools, and like for defending, you know, community schools and things like that. And he, uh, was, we were at a conference and he was speaking and talking about, um, like all like the racist rhetoric that you get around like sort of you know like like the myth of the welfare queen and, and the broken family and like you know where, where where do you put the blame when 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 our schools are crumbling where is the blame when when, when our graduation rate is fifty percent um, and he talked about like how you know the black people have been here since the beginning you know we've been here since the beginning not me. Run. We've been here for years since the beginning, and we're still at the bottom. Four hundred years later, we've been here since the beginning. We're still at the bottom. So either there's something wrong with us, or there's something wrong with the system, and they can't allow anyone to believe that there's something wrong with the system. And so they've got to keep black people down. And and so like I mean, any movement for change in the society, if you want anything to get better, you have to get to the root. And and, and part you know, part of the root of, of what's wrong with the system is is you know, this system is based on the oppression of black people, yeah. the, on, on the extirpation of, of, of black slaves from Africa, and, and, and 400 years of, of black oppression in, the, in this country. So any movement for change has to get to the root of that. And, and any movement for racial equality is going to be threatening the heart of the system very much. Because like, it's, it's not like you can't just say, let's have equal funding for schools. We can't just say, we just learn our communities because it gets us to the very center of, of what this country's built on. And that's why, like, I mean, it's so important for the league to, like, actually, like, band together as much as possible mm -hmm. because they want us to be a part. Yes. And we, they want, they don't want us to have a movement that can successfully build, not a fight back. And it's, like, a very, I don't know, we need to get down to tax. <laughs> that's good. Did you raise your hand to speak? Who's good? <laughs> My name is Jerry. I so am too. I learned. Bottom lot since I've been here in Rochester. What? <clears throat> Different events and things that have taken place. And <clears throat> meeting different people's opinions and their expressing their hearts and stuff like that. But um as far as things go with history, with culture and all that, that's not gonna change. That's not going to change. That's something that's going to be here. We have to be taught how to have a mechanism to work it. Dealing with people, different diversity of people. We're doing that already. But the thing is, our main focus is, what are we going to work out as far as everybody receiving abuse of Injustice from the system, right? This is what we're just about. This is because you know, you know, we 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 can all sit in here and you know understand, sympathize, and have empathy. I understand each and every the neglect, the have nots, and all that. You know, but what are we going to do when the rubber meets the road? When they Heat. It starts heating up our backsides, uh, just like Obama. He's the president with his bully pulpit, but when it comes down to it, there are powers that surrounds him that controls the power that he has that heats up his backside, though he wants to be right more than he can. But the same thing here, even with the chief, you know, he knows what's wrong. He knows what's right. But the thing is, they want us to believe that what really is going on, America has been dumbed down. Being dumbed down. They want us dumbed down, this silent thing. Like the pastor was talking, we heard somebody, the Obama talked about this silent sickness. You have physical illnesses and all that, but. Nobody's talking about that silent sickness, and that's that mental stuff. And those police have it too. But what do we do when the rubber meets the road and when uh, we're going to be challenged? We're going to be challenged. I may start getting some stuff once I get back to Elmira. <laughs> you know, small town here from Elmira, we, we've a uh, diverse of people that mingle with white folks, black folks. 
Like I said, we went to school, the doctor's office and stuff like that, but things have truly changed over the years and people have forgotten where they come because you're dealing with a different generation now. But the point is, what are we going to do? Do we have something that's going to back us up? I see that you got lawyers in here, the young man that Nina met, and this young man with the pad over here writing going on. And I hear your minds and, and I hear a lot of truth and stuff. What are we going to do when it comes down to the rubber meeting the road? If we are really going to stick with this, because like the forefathers before us, Martin Luther King and some other people and some other Caucasian brothers that put their lives on the lines to believe in a cause, are you willing to stick this thing out? Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. Thanks. I got the next speaker in red. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say, um, we have to keep it going. We have to step it up. We have to keep um, making our presence known in the community. Because today, I was on the internet looking at um, the news for Rochester. So now TV10 has a, a feature that they're doing on the Rochester, hometown Rochester cops. I okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wow, These, they they grew up that. here, they're from here, they know oh, their neighbor. Wow. They wow. love their neighborhood. So, okay. so wow. TV Ten has stepped it up, they doing that. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they're cooking with the kids at the high school oh, at yeah. East High School. Oh, and so it, it's putting a pressure on them, but they they're the heat is not on there right now. They're trying to do nice things. But really, you know, that's not what they want to do. And then, you know, starting with the schools, I'm a daycare provider. I work in a center, and I have kids from all, from all the schools. But um, I have this one particular kid who's eight years old, and he has tantrums like a one-year-old, and he just won't stop. And I asked one of the girls in the class, I go, does he do it here, or does he do it in school? He does it in school. She goes, every day he's in our class disrupting, he does the same thing. So I'm thinking like, why has this teacher let this child do this all year long? Why haven't you tried <coughs> to help him a little bit? Because they want to keep him down, you know why? Because this man, he is so smart. This little boy is so smart. He could probably go to the next two grades and make it. But because of his behavior, because of his maturity, of course we can't, of course we can't send him back. We might have to keep him back. We might have to make him repeat a grade. When the boy is already doing this third grade work, he could probably do a fifth grader's work. Yeah. So I just sat down yesterday and I just had a talk with him. And it's like nobody, I don't know, his parents would have never sat down to him and told him, you know, you could be president, you could be senator. I said, you could skip a grade. If you were my child, I would have you skip a grade because you're bored. You yeah, need some true. tougher work. Mm -hmm. But it's never been said to him. All it's said to him is stop this negative behavior. Stop acting like a two-year-old. You know, but that's all he was taught. And so a lot of times in the, in the schools, the teachers and stuff, the, the administrators, they see these young boys. I'm going to say because my son was picked on the same way when he was in school. He was smart. He was in the math program. But because I was a single mom, he couldn't be smart. He couldn't go anywhere. He shouldn't do anything. So the, the administrator would say, you called and he's not smiling today. Is something going on in school? What do you mean he's not smiling? Is he in school? Is he disrupting you? Does his homework done? That's what you should be calling me about, not because he's not smiling. So in schools, I mean, they they go to school, they're taught, the administrators and the teachers are taught to keep these young men down, to keep them oppressed, because they don't tell them the things, they don't help them with the problems that are going on. And it may not be at home. He's just bored, I think. He's just bored. He's not getting attention because he gets the work. So how else can I get attention? So you got to give him some outlets. I'm like, you could be all these things, but we got to take care of this behavior. And he's like, really? Yeah, so we wrote down what he could be, what he wanted to be. And so when he feels that coming out, he can look at it. And I, I pray that that helps him stop the behavior because he's very, very smart. But it starts in elementary school. It starts when they're young. They keep them oppressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that's good. Well, I definitely concur with you saying from 
city school district, every school that I went to either was developed before I came or after. I went to number 22 school when I was a kid, don't really remember that, but if you go look at number 22 school on Jefferson, it's like a prison. Yeah. Number 45 school developed before I came, developed again, before I left. Fresh Douglas went there for two years to middle school. Um, redeveloped after I left, they kicked me out and I loved that school and we had to relocate. Luckily, I was to go to Edison, one of the better schools in the school district. That got developed right after I left or while I was there. The faulty school system, this education system has failed us. I had some teachers telling me I'm never going to be anything, all this and that, but luckily I had some teachers who were telling me, I think you can be anything you want, your writing is so excellent. My favorite teacher in the world, Ms. Baker, in one of my um, essays, that I wrote about principal who kept finger pointing me, sending me to the ISS, not listening to me, calling my dad in a heartbeat, and not giving me any respect. I was angry at her, wrote um, a whole essay about her, how she could help the school thrive better. She um, entered that for essay contest. I won the essay contest over everybody in the suburbs and in the city, and I was so surprised. <laughs> Hundreds of entries were in there, and I didn't even know my work within it, I won. And that changed my life. Without teachers like that, this system is going to continue to get worse. But what I wanted to say was that teachers don't care because they have a house in the suburbs, they have their own business, they're set. It's the people who deal with this, the people in this room, that we have to hold people accountable more. We have to do, we have to work harder. And I never was convinced that Jim Crow was gone. And I'm glad now that there's books out about it and there's more public information now. It's on the news a little bit now because Jim Crow never left. How can people who went through 500 years of slavery be better after just a couple of hundred years? They need 500 years of extra help. <laughs> just like oh, I need that extra time after school to learn vocabulary words in my essay writing, I need more help than other students. So how could you end affirmative action? How could you keep putting people in jail and not help those people when they get out of jail? I said it before and I'm saying it again. This is, I guess, one of my solutions. Help people transition out of jail way more than what you're doing, because they're going to go right back. And my brother was a good kid. He started selling cars at 15. And when he got, he didn't serve in time, but if, you know, the second time he got in, yeah, my, my parent, my dad here, who's a good parent, couldn't help him as much as he needed help. But if he would have had more transition when he got out, he probably wouldn't have went back in. So they want the whole system to not be equal, obviously, because it's a big business, I'm learning. But, um, what was it? Uh, the cops are the front line of our oppression. A lot of stuff, as I said, they're basically like pimp slapping us around. Um, and we need to use the resources better to help communities. Sister Felicia said a good point that we need some monuments down in the hood. And I'm sick and tired of people calling, and I just said it, I'm so used to it. My quarters, my living quarters, the hood, and it's not the neighborhood. In Pittsburgh, it's the neighborhood, but I live in the hood where there's cracked sidewalks and everything. One day um, I was working with my stepdad doing construction stuff and we drove from Hilton where we were building houses at into the city and I stood outside the window for the whole time and I saw how things changed. We went from homes with big lakes and tire swings to a big highway. The highway got more junkier as we traveled. We got to the city, the sidewalks were messed up, houses were messed up, we got addicts walking around, drug goes on the corner and then we put them to my house. So that's unfair. It needs to be more help from the government, but what we have to do is just stay confident and work together and bring this to the forefront, to the front burners. That's all I have. All right. We got me next. Uh, so we wanted to address the question of what do we do, because I think that's that's always the question. Um, we get, I think, a lot of people anxious when we're sitting in meetings all the time. Um, but I think. Um, like, I think one thing that's important to, to recognize is that the black struggle for freedom has been uninterrupted since the very beginning. Mm. Sometimes it's like this, where we have meetings and we have small scale struggles, small scale, you know, um, meetings and, you know, like, you know, small campaigns. Sometimes it explodes, like it did in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Sometimes it's in the streets, it's visible. But both of those things need each other. Both of those things are integral part of building the movement. And I want to give one example. Um, but we, like we, um, if you read about you know how the uh, the sit-ins uh, uh, developed mm -hmm. in the, in the, during the civil rights movement, right. there wasn't some spontaneous action by these young, um, by these young black kids. You know, like they were scared, they were frightened. The only thing that got them through that was the months of organization 
and the NAACP youth. Months of organization. Like, what do you do when the cops confront you? How do you deal with that? Like, we got your back. Let's let's plan it out. Let's plan out this action. Was, this was months of organizing meetings that led to one of the biggest actions that sparked the entire civil rights movement. So what we see, what we learn in history, is that a bunch of kids just you know decided not to move, and all of a sudden racism was over. But this is, the, I mean, that was not the case at all. It took months of organizing, months of, um, and years, years of organization, and working out our ideas. Like, what do we, what do we want? Even, you know, agreeing on something that we want. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, but this is this is where they started. This is like, you know, every every major um, campaign, every major organization, every major victory that Black people in this country have ever had started in rooms like this, in churches like this. Yes. Um, uh, that's. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll wait till the end. Right. I've got uh, Nick next to be followed by Brian. I didn't see any other hands, so if you want to speak. Arthur. Okay. Um, yeah, it's like um, the whole thing like know your rights and all of that um, mentioned earlier. And in some ways, it's just like you know, <coughs> that the, we only have these rights that you know they haven't eroded yet. Yeah. And the only way we win them back is with these mass, the mass movements saying no, because you know the masses of people, you know, black, brown, white, you know, together, you know, in solidarity, we have this power to say no. Yes, yeah. Yes. I mean, the, the people who actually, you know, make society work, you know, who are you know making things instead of owning the things that make things. And that are operated by the rest of us. You know, we have the power to say no. We have the power to strike directly at where they get their money, how, the, and just come together, all of us saying no. And when we all come together and say no, we can actually smash this apparatus mm -hmm. that must divide us, must erode our rights in order for it to survive. Mm -hmm. And you know, once, only when we actually smash that can we build something new that, a, a system where, you know, we don't have anybody left to oppress because it's in all of our best interest to work together, yes, right. <laughs> you know. Yes. And when we actually do that, then we can finally be a post-racial society. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next, we followed by Arthur Brooks III. <laughs> yes, um, that's a perfect introduction. I wanted to raise the idea because uh, Brother Jerry had asked about um, kind of the whole system of what we're up against, of which the racism of the police is just one small constituent part uh, of, a, of a vast system of. of Oppression and, and, and exploitation and so on. That you know, how do we get to the root of it? And and as, as socialists, our, our group basically thinks that we need a revolution. That that only the people taking power into their own hands is going to solve the problems that we've got. Uh, the question, of course, is how do we do that? Um, and and so so that that's why we we actually put a lot of emphasis on on understanding our history and trying to figure out a theory of how things fit together, which is what we use Marxism and stuff like that for. Um, but, but also, it, it, it situates us in what we're doing today, because our understanding that we need everyone to come together and take power out of the hands of that tiny minority who, who own it, but also happen to have the cops in the army. Uh, <laughs> getting everybody together to do that is going to require uniting us on a principled way. Yes. Which means, first and foremost, in the basic, the, the, the biggest division that's, that's, that gaps in, in, in the, among workers in, in, in the US. Uh, Nick said that the workers have the power. The people who produce things have the power. It's true. Mm -hmm. But they keep us from exercising that by keeping us divided. And racism is the best way right. to do it. There's other ways. I mean, there, there's homophobia, there's sex, there's all kinds of, of nasty ideas <laughs> that, are, that, are, that the system can't dispense with, actually. Um, but, but what we have to do is 
figure out a way to unite people on fighting for equality of everybody. Everybody who's despised deserves to be equal. That is, championing the cause of the oppressed is what we as socialists have to do in order to ever get anywhere near the revolution. Otherwise, we won't have a movement that can liberate itself. Because that's what it's about. It's the self-liberation, the self-emancipation of working people. And in order to get to that point, we have to fight racism. And in order to do that in Rochester, we have to take on profiling and, and defend Benny War. And, and, you know, so this, this, this idea of, of revolution kind of serves us to, to guide, in some ways, what we think is important to get involved in right now. And, and that's why we're, we're part of a movement we hope is going to spill out into a lot of people kind of changing their minds about all kinds of things. Hi, everyone. I'm Arthur Brooks III. <laughs> <laughs> this is my son. But, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, amazing just to see over the last few weeks with, uh, with Benny the, the love and support uh, from not, not just the black community, the white community, but that's what that's what love is. Though it's, it's not about uh, being separated. It's not about the color. It's just being together. We all, everybody came together for for one cause. Yes. You know, which which is right. You know, we stand up for right, right righteousness. Uh, I had went uh, to Albany a few years back, and I did some other things. Uh, March with some of you people before downtown, and I kind of got away from you know because sometimes you get caught up in your own life. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so you never know how you're going to be drawn back into. Situation you never know how you're gonna be drawn back into the lane, you know. But but through uh, Benny, it's, it's pulled me back in because even the night I was tired, I was gonna go home. But I uh, uh, told my son about it after we got the text, that, uh, and I told my wife, I said, well, you know, something that I gotta do. Somebody had to stand up for for for, for right, and it, it, you know, because we are a small group right now. Mm -hmm. But like Brian said, it, it, it's, it needs to spill out, yes. you know, because even when Martin Luther King got into it, he wasn't. That wasn't really what he really wanted to do. He, he kind of got drawn into it, you know. So you never know how you get drawn into things, you know, and then you just had to go with the flow after that. But uh, uh, it, it's, it's good just to see the different uh, people here. Uh, and was here the other night, he was here also. So, you know, uh, and I think from the aspect of what is next, what is next is just uh, whatever it is, we just have to be consistent with it. The word consistent. Comes and comes to mind. We have to be consistent about the meeting. I know uh, everybody can't make all the meetings or, or whatever, but it has to be a consistency. Okay, I might can't be here a week. You might can't be here a week, but somebody needs to be here, and we still need to keep it going. Cause a lot of times, what happens, especially in, the, in my men's group over at the church that we do, I've been with fast for eight, nine years now. We, we start off strong, like a ball of fire, yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we just. <laughs> Goes off. I know that. Yeah, you know, you know, you know the feeling there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know so, so, so even, even with this, starting out, okay, we got a nice. I don't know. I think I counted twenty some people earlier. Maybe twenty five. I think. So you know, n next week it needs to be a few more. You know. Invite someone. Yeah. 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 Invite someone. Yeah. It, it, it needs to be that consistency, you know, of 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 a month from now after you guys go to Chicago. What, what, what's after that in August? What's after that in September? You know what I mean? It can't go down to from 25, 35, down to 10, down to 5. You know what I mean? Because this, this is what they want anyways. They don't want people to stand up and, and, and fight for the right causes. Because if, if, if we get together strong, you can change things. And, and, you know, and, and even with this, I'm gonna, and then I got to go. But uh, uh, even, even, even with gas prices. I truly believe if Martin Luther King was around today, he could organize people enough to say, okay, we are not going to take this. We're not going to take these high gas prices. Because, because one of the solutions is, okay, everybody go to Hess gas station. Don't go to these other stations. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden, these other stations are dropping their prices because they because everybody going over to Hess. Mm -hmm. So you know what I mean? So it's, it's, a, it's about organiz being organized, but it's about who's going to step up and say, okay, listen. Oh, it, it, I'm just, even, even for us in the room here, okay, we all can go to Hess for a week. Tell your friends, just go to Hess, don't go nowhere else, or whatever it may be, whatever gas station. But you'll see a change. You'll see a change. So the people, we have the power. We just don't realize sometimes how much control we really have with the government. The government has the control because we sit back and say, oh, well, I can't stop this. But there's a lot, as a, as a group, 
Okay, the blacks can't stop by themselves. The whites can't stop by themselves. The Spanish can't stop by themselves. The Japanese, Koreans can't stop by themselves. But together, we can stop a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 even, even with, uh, and, and I have talked with Chief Shepard quite often. You know, and I have some friends on the police force. But just like in any any situation, everybody's not good, everybody's not bad. But it comes down to the situation. Look at each individual situation. That, that that's how we have to look at things. Even when you read that statistic about uh, police officers haven't been charged since '92 or something, I find it hard to believe because I I I I, I, I watch Chicago news faithfully. I know more about Chicago than I do about our news. But I, it's so interesting though, what's going on there. But I, I see how people get killed. I see New York City how people get killed, and it's by police officers. Uh, the one guy he was he was in the corner. He pulled out his wallet and he got mm -hmm. shot. Yep. They they blast him fifty hundred times. There's no need for that. That's overkill. But to see that, okay, and, 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 and even in a race today, even in society today, it may be uh, uh, get physical. Okay, we may have to do a sit-in. But okay, but you know not to do anything. You just sit there. The police may throw you down, but you don't resist. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, what our forefathers had to go through, uh, uh, some of us we would have to be trained not to do certain things. Because mm -hmm. instincts come in. Because uh -huh. I'm not used to nobody just grabbing me and I'm not doing nothing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it comes down to training. You know, it comes down to, okay, verbally been assaulted. Uh, we do this over at church. We have done different uh, skits to, to go out and meet people. You know, from the Christian standpoint, you know, but then we got somebody who's not Christian or maybe don't even want to hear that. So you got to know how to act. You got to know how to approach them. So even with this, it made me need the same thing where you uh, uh, role play. You know what I mean? So that, that, this is something down the road to look at. But just don't let this fizzle out. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, from, from my standpoint either, because I, I do, I have a lot to do, try to start my own business and stuff like that. But I, I understand, though, I need to be here for him. For my daughter, and, and, and not even for just them, other people, kids, because because everybody needs a voice, you know, and, and a lot of them don't have a voice. So if I'm not here one week, it, it's not, yeah, 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 yeah. It ain't even since I'm in contact with me. But but I I, I I I will be around. I'll keep in contact, you know. But I I I, I can come in and run out. So just to let you know ahead of time. All right, thank you. Next on the stack, I've got uh, Benny, who'll be followed by James, and I'm going to take a call for our last round of speakers before I throw it back to yeah, you. Okay, I'm Benny. Um, I just want to say, this is going to be quick and short. It's, not, it's just that, uh, for me, I just want everybody to be ready, because this is a big commitment, and we're going to have casualties. You can believe that. They're going to come at us with all they got. You understand what I'm saying? So sometimes that put fear in people. But if we can keep that strength and that strongness, you understand, we're going to win. We're going to win. You understand? So that's basically all I have to say. God bless you. Well, that was short. Yes, yeah. that was. <laughs> yeah. I'll listen to you. Yeah, um. I was just thinking about people talking about how like they're trying to keep us divided, trying to keep white and black people divided, and it made me think about my school. I went to RIT, and the the workers at RIT tried to form a union to demand better pay because RIT wasn't paying them anything really. And uh, one of RIT's strategies, they immediately started dividing the workers up by race and like telling the white workers like you do not want a union because it's really all the the, the custodians and the workers that were mostly black like they're just being lazy and they want a bunch of money and they're trying to like get it out of you. And they ended up breaking the union drive by dividing the white workers and the black workers and basically mm -hmm. convincing the white workers not to accept more money in order to harm the black workers. And I think that like shows both like how powerful racism is as a tool for the, the people who in power and also like how far we have left to go if they can actually convince white workers like to keep lower wages, like in basically act against their own interests out of like this racist idea. I think that, that shows how far we have to go as a society. Um, but I, I think that history has shown that we can actually overcome this. And I was just thinking about um, ideas, and it's just like, because um, people were thinking, like, what do we do now? Like, wh where do we go forward? And I was just um, popped into my head, like, if the, the, the cops have this TV show where they're trying to show how awesome they are about, like, going out and going to schools and doing barbecues and stuff, can we, like, go to those schools, find out where the, the camp people are going to go, and, like, hold up signs, like, behind the cops, like, while they're doing this? Like, I think, like, it would be very hard to 
to film cops like doing all these good things if we just called them around. Like I think like basic things we could do like and it's that, that. It's, some, it's, it's a number you can call. Yeah. <laughs> they won't be so nice then. Yeah. Yeah. They're gonna be upset. Officer friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Officer sunshine, yeah. So I've got uh, nobody else on the stack, if, unless there's any other comments, I'll kick it back to Reem. Uh, I'll just, just, just raise if, if uh, folks don't, didn't know uh, that we, we had some contact with the police and, and, and the Benny Ware, Benny Ware petition campaign on Saturday at Aberdeen Square with the police um, setting up a table right next to our Haymarket books table where we had, where we had all our books and, and, and we had a, a uh, petition gathering Okay, we've got about 100 signatures or so, uh, and, and talked to pretty much everybody who walked by, uh, and, and upstaged the police. They had the officers friendly there, uh, but, but they, uh, they weren't doing that well uh, side by side with us. And, and they chose to be there, it was weird. Uh, but, uh, but basically, uh, that, was, that was our experience last week. They, they sent the friendly ones out. Uh, we, we need to keep an eye on the other ones, and then some of the, the uh, the videos that have surfaced and so on, uh, and that continue to surface around Benny's case and, and others that are going on, are what we'll have to look at uh, kind of concretely in terms of what's organized in the neighborhoods and uh, give people a voice in, in what's going on. Uh, so I think uh, just to, just to wrap up, I've, there's uh, something sort of sort of uh, something that we talk about a lot when we're, we're having these meetings is, you know. What we need as a movement, um, and what we need as a as a as a as, a, as an anti-racist, um, you know, like community is uh, we need I, I think three things. First is organization. We need to be organized. We need to have meetings like this. We need to have education. We need to have uh, we need to get together in the same room <laughs> and like actually talk these things out. Um, second, we need politics, and by politics I don't mean electing black leaders because we all, we all know how that's turned out for us. Um, but by politics, I mean we have to work out our ideas. What kind of society do we want? What kind of struggle do we, do we want to develop? Um, and, and also, not everybody's on the same page. And that's why we need ideas. Because when we go out into the streets, uh, we're going to have people say, we need more cops. We're going to have people that, that say, we need, we, we, those, those schools need to be closing. Those schools aren't doing anything anyway. Like, you know, there's, there's going to be people that make these arguments. We need to, we need to, we need to actually be able to articulate why, why we need this to keep, keep schools open. Why we need more resources in the cities. Why we need, because all that, all those, all those other ideas are being shaped by the media, by the, by the, um, by those of us, by, by those people who don't want us to, 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 to unite, who don't want us to see, don't, don't, don't want to see a different society. Those are the things that steep people's ideas. White workers, for example. There's, you know, there's, um, you know, how did, like, the way that we, we live, we grow up in a racist society, so we adopt these racist ideas. Everybody has a little bit of, you know, like the, the, the things that we learn in school and the things that we um, grow up uh, learning from our friends and family and our communities. Um, the, everybody has something that, that's like, holding them back from, you know, like, actually reaching out and, and uniting with other people. Like, we have to root that out and, and, and be able to explain that this is. This is this is these are the things that are holding us back. We have to be able to argue those um, argue those ideas mm -hmm. to other people. Um, and, and lastly, uh, but I think most importantly, we need struggle. Um, and that the organization and the politics inform our struggle, our strategy. What kind of strategy we want going forward? Um, you know, and, and, and we, when when police brutality happens, we want not 10 people, not 15 people. We want 100, 150, 1,500 people outside the police police uh, headquarters, outside the city uh, city hall. We need that. We need that element. Um, mm -hmm. But we have to be able to win people to that strategy, and we have to be able to organize um, so that we can do it effectively. Uh, so I think all these things um, are really um, necessary. And what we have, um, what we have is, is that. You, you can't talk about any struggle in this country without talking about race. There's not a single struggle of poor and working class people in this country that does not have a, does, that does not have a racial element. When you talk about the education, uh, the crisis in education, the crisis in education is happening in schools, in, 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 in schools in the inner city, um, in predominantly black and brown schools that are underfunded, under, um, underutilized, and, and um, they, 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 so the, you can't talk about the crumbling of our public public school system without talking about race. Um, you can't talk about the problems of unemployment in this country without talking about race. You can't talk about immigration um, uh, reforms and and and, and um, things like that without talking about race. You can't talk about mass incarceration without talking about race. 
And you can't talk about war without talking about race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, the, the, the primary way in which they, 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 they prosecute their wars is by saying that, you know, um, black and brown people overseas are actually the problem and we have to bring our democracy, we have to bring our, our, our way of life to them. You can't talk about anything, any struggle in this country without talking about race. And that's what we have as activists, as, as, as people engaged in the struggle, that's what we have to contribute. Any, scr any struggle, whether it's, whether it's teachers, um, you know, instructing workers, whatever, we have to, we have to bring the, the necessity of actually challenging racism into that discussion. Um, if it's not there already, and, and, and expand it as much as possible, and talk about how the racism is the central element in all these struggles um, that's keeping us divided. And that's what we have to contribute. That's, that's what you know. Um, this meeting is really, uh, and, and our future meetings, I think, are, are really meant to address. Mm -hmm. like, and I think that's. Um, I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> <laughs>